Mr. Chairman, Mr. Anil Godwa, fellow panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first like to thank the organizers for this, this uh, seventh dialogue. I think we have made great progress. We have done well. I divide my comments, the eight minutes chairman has kindly given to me, into three sections. First, two words on current state of play. Second, going forward, what do we look at? And third, on daily dialogue. The current state of play, I would say that there are relations between member states of ASEAN and India are totally problem free. There are no issues that, uh, that bock us. Actually, things are going pretty smoothly. Except one comment I have is that what has been achieved is nothing near what can be achieved. And therefore, we are still very shocked. That's the conclusion I have of the present state of play. Then I go on to uh, the future, or rather, you know, going forward, what do we do? Let me look at two uh, angles. One is the political, the other one is the economic. Going forward, it's not going to be a walk in the park. In other words, it is going to be somewhat difficult. Someone said it in one of the earlier this thing, we have a tremendous future going forward. Yes, future is good, but how do you, how does it materialize? Sometimes it reminds me when I started golf 30 years ago, my coach told me I would be a single handicapper. After 30 years, I'm still at 20. That's because I I hit a long ball, but it goes to the wrong direction. So that is maybe what is plaguing us. Now, there are two issues in the political side. One is ASEAN itself. The ASEAN that was built, which was seen as a totally solid, united organization, today suffers from certain stresses. This is partly due to domestic politics, of the member countries, partly due to the fact that outside forces have now influenced on some of the member states to decide on their positions. In such a situation, it is very difficult for another country to come in and gain traction. India, must be remembered, is a late entrant into ASEAN, in spite of its age-long relationship with Southeast Asia. I've seen a play in Indonesian on the, on the movement of Hanuman through Southeast Asia, how Hanuman is seen by each of the Southeast Asian countries. But that's history. Current is something else. So that is the problem with the political side. So it is going to be tough. Then on the economic side, I think Dr. Day made a very good presentation and he highlighted all the problems that we are facing. I really wonder, we are not short of initiatives, we've got so many initiatives, don't add any more of them, try to, try to implement them. Why are they not happening? I'm a very simple-minded private sector person, so to say this in front of, a, of, a, of an audience which is made up largely by bureaucrats, I'm a little frightened, but since there are no rotten eggs around, I'll take the risk. I think we should, one institution, we've got so many institutions, including mine in Singapore, we should take a, do a study to look at how some of these initiatives can be actually hived off or outsourced to the private sector. They will find the money, they have the initiative, they have the drive, provided there is a profit to be made, I think they will implement many of the things. Some of them cannot be because it has to get government approval, government sanctions, and that takes time. But even that, there are ways of doing it. There are people, I mean, take a simple example. Visa from Indian government is now outsourced to travel companies. Travel companies can actually do all the paperwork and give it to them to do a job, and it makes it much faster. You used to have to line up not during your time, I know, but when I was young, two weeks to get a visa. Now, 24 hours, you get a visa. This because they, it's outsourced. 
So you can do something like that, but it is. But the basic thing that we must remember is, I think, two factors. One, India must realize that it is a late entrant and therefore prepared to make significant, uh, I won't say concessions, but significant policies, significant things to do to, so that ASEAN will find it necessary to have them. They, they are good. Recently, there was an article on RECP written by a commentator, a very knowledgeable commentator, and he made a statement. I cannot see this coming to a quick conclusion because India is a member and India negotiators are formidable. They can keep things going for a long time. So the, the feeling is that you, you will object to this, but I'm just telling you what happened. This is published in Straight Times about a week ago. Now, first, India must feel that they want to end, they want to interact with ASEAN. They want to gain traction in ASEAN. Not because China is there, not because Japan is there, no. On their own, they want to be. Then, once the realization comes, I think the first step. The second step is ASEAN must realize it is good to have. Somebody said just now, India has well, everything to gain, and ASEAN, uh, well, will go along. No. I think ASEAN needs India in as a engage as a partner. Singapore realized this. That's why we fought very hard to make sure first uh, sectoral dialogue partner, then full dialogue partner. Even today, Singapore stands as one of the advocates of engaging India. And that is because we see the geopolitical necessity to have India as part of ASEAN, or part, as a member, as a partner of ASEAN. So that is what is necessary. Sometime in 2011, my institute, Institute of South Asian Studies, they do, we do every two years a diaspora convention. And the 2011 convention, my good friend Mr. Tarun Das, who was then mentor for CII, said India should open its doors totally to its immediate neighbors, meaning South members. And then he was received with such applause. Because what he was trying to say, India is so large, why not make some concessions and you gain a lot of friends. But whether that will happen in my lifetime or your lifetime, I don't know. But it is a suggestion. So unless the concessions are made, I think it is going to be extremely difficult for India to gain traction and ASEAN to benefit from India's participation. One area, somebody mentioned it, I think uh, Ambassador Bhatia mentioned or someone did. The space engineering, is the bell ringing? No, yeah. not yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Your, there are certain technologies that India has. The ability to produce uh, a vehicle that is a fraction of the cost of what the developed countries and even China makes, that tells you of a certain advancement in technology. There are other applications that not Singapore companies don't want to, or Malaysian companies don't want to go to, to space or anywhere. Maybe they do, but anyway, there are other priorities. But your engineering, electronic engineering capabilities can be shared. You can do investments. One of the things when I said bring the private sector, Indian, uh, Indian companies, large companies, they've got huge amount of cash. They are very resourceful. They do extremely well. They have been gaining their strength in a very comf in the comfort of a protected uh, country. But now it's open. They are equally able to compete. If they can be paired together with ASEAN companies, they can solve all the problems. And I think the contribution that India can make is tremendous in the field of engineering, in the field of many other things. So. I think this is something that must be um, considered. My final point on the, um, the what to, how to go forward on the, the uh, Delhi dialogue. Uh, first and foremost, I think to keep a dialogue of this size and retain the interests of everybody, 
unless you get only retirees. It is very difficult on an annual basis. So my suggestion is, while you don't want to, as uh, the deputy uh, CEO said, of, you don't want to drop good things, I agree. But you don't have to have it at such frequency. You can't retain interest. You can't get sufficient discussion going. But if you have a, even a slightly longer session, but maybe once in every two years. Our South Asian Diaspora Conference, we do it once in two years. Because we just cannot sustain. So that's number one. There is at the moment too much of discussion on the big picture. I think we need to focus. We need to find. And I would strongly advise that we have more business discussions because that is what sustains it. You have to earn a profit. It's a dirty word, but still, it is a very useful, essential word. And therefore, I think you should look at how this can be done. Bring in the sm small and medium companies. ASEAN is full of very vibrant small and medium companies. And India is no worse off. They have. Marry them, you get a lot of those things. The di dialogue needs to avoid repetition, both in teams as well as presenters. In this regard, it may be useful to consider the possibility, as I said, of holding it once in two years. The, the equal importance given to all the themes, I think, should be reconsidered. I think perhaps you should pri prioritize and then take it on that basis. So some of them can be well, not discarded, but given a lower priority. You can have simultaneous uh, fee, uh, uh, programs, whereas the lesser ones can be taken at, uh, as a parallel with things. And finally, uh, the idea of having, uh, as I s said earlier, a business segment, I would try to persuade you to consider that. Thank you very much.